So in this problem, as we've seen uh, several times now, we have the flow in the cylindrical tube and we chose a control space that looks like this. So uh, we have a real cylindrical tube with a real radius, but we chose a virtual subspace in the tube, which has a thickness between R and R plus delta R in the radial direction and a thickness between Z and Z plus delta Z in the axial direction. So if you like, it's the thickness of a sub-cylinder. If you can imagine a small cylinder inside a bigger cylinder, then we are looking at the space that is in the thickness of the wall of that sub-cylinder. It's uh, not the space inside the cylinder. And so we've done all this development, which we won't repeat now. Uh, we looked at uh, working out the, we estimate the number of moles in, that, uh, in the wall of that sub-cylinder. We write the balance in terms of the um, diffusion flux in the radial and axial directions. And then we have flow uh, through that space as well. So flow through the thickness of that wall. Um, and then we derive, 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 and then we get our differential equation here, right? Um, are there any questions about that setup? All right, so we derived the set length a couple of times now. So now when we did this, we had acknowledged at the outset that the velocity could change with time in uh, with r position, with z position, with theta position. In other words, we could say that um, we can identify at any position in the space. And remember, this is in the sub-cylinder. It's in the thickness of the wall here. So if we picked any point in the space, then we, we can identify a velocity there. So if you pick a, a point on this uh, face here, pointing into the thickness of the cylinder, then it looks like that. And then equally, you could pick also um, any other position. Uh, let's say we pick another one here. Uh, then there's, uh, in principle, there's another uh, velocity there. Um, and so that's velocity in the z direction. We could also define a velocity in the r direction. And we could also define a velocity, an angular velocity. So um, how fast is fluid flowing like that? Um, so all those apply. But uh, we chose to focus on uz. We said ur is small, right? The fluid is not really flowing in the r direction. And um, there's nothing to suggest it's really rotating around either. So, <clears throat> so the UZ, uh, that's what we are talking about right now. So this goes towards our question, laminar flow and turbulent flow, right? So uh, yeah, perfect plug flow. Now, when we say perfect plug flow, that means that all our fluid is flowing as if in slugs. So you've got, um, if you just look at the pipeline, if you look at a cross section in the pipeline. So this was the 3D drawing. This is just the 2D uh, drawing on, on the side. So in this case, if it's in perfect plug flow, that means all our fluid has the same velocity in the Z direction. So UZ is a flat profile like that. So this is plug flow. In laminar flow, we have a different situation. So here's, uh, the, here's the, the pipeline, the real pipeline. Then in laminar flow, uh, one of the assumptions is that there's perfect friction at the wall. So perfect friction means, or, or uh, the right way to say it is no slip at the wall. No slip means the velocity here will be zero. So we've picked a position Z in the tube. And I'm just going to dot line it. And our velocity profile, so we are drawing a profile of velocities. Um, it's going to be highest in the center. So if you think about, uh, let's see, if you think about the center line position, that's uh, the center line is the furthest away from the wall. Right, so the center line is where we expect the highest velocity. Right, so we expect the highest velocity 
in the center because that's the furthest away from the wall. And at the wall, we expect a zero velocity, right? So if that's the case, then we are going to get a profile that looks something like this. So it's going to be zero at the wall. It will go to some maximum and then it's symmetrical. So it goes back like that. So a laminar velocity profile looks like this, right? Um, the, in plug flow, we don't have that. In plug flow, we don't have zero velocity every, uh, anywhere, but um, it's flat. It's the same non-zero velocity everywhere. So you pick any point in the tube and your velocity is some fixed value, right? Whereas in laminar flow, uh, the closer you get to the wall, the lower the velocity will be. And you will derive this profile in detail in the second part of the course. Um, so uh, Mr. Pilani Biela, uh, he's uh, my PhD uh, student and uh, he's working at Cecil and he's going to join us for the second part of the course and he will take you through the derivation of this profile in detail. For now, it's sufficient for us to acknowledge in laminar flow, we have a drag at the wall. And so the fluid is in a no slip condition at the wall. So no slip means the friction is causing your velocity to be zero there. So you have no slip at the wall. So U equals zero there, U equals zero. And I should specify uz equals zero, right? So uz equals zero um, at the wall. And at the center, your velocity is its maximum value. So u equals u max. And there are all kinds of interesting um, relationships, for example, uh, the ma the maximum velocity is actually uh, twice the average velocity in a laminar flow. You will also prove that um, this is a quadratic, that in laminar flow, um, let's do it down here so we can say in laminar flow, in laminar flow, we have the quadratic, so u z as a function of r equals, and the way we write that is u max, oops, u max times one minus, and that's r over r, r over r squared. So <clears throat> you will derive this later in the course. You'll show that in laminar flow, your velocity is given by this relationship. And if you just have a look at this, you can see, um, so R, capital R, is the real radius of the pipeline. So when we are looking at points at, uh, the, at the wall where R equals R, Right, then you've got R divided by R, that's one, one minus one is zero. So at the wall, it's zero, right? So this, uh, this equation does agree uh, when we have uh, uh, R equals the radius. And then when we are looking at the center line position where uh, R equals zero, then of course this becomes a zero and you can see one minus uh, zero. So it's equal to U max. So at the center line, we are at the maximum velocity. At the wall, we are at zero. So this equation fits those two at least. Uh, you can also see that the maximum possible value of this function is where uh, this lowercase r is equal to zero. So all of that agrees with uh, what we think about laminar flow. Um, and by the way, laminar flow, it's not so, uh, this is a very uh, specific uh, view of laminar flow. Of course, if you think about um, opening, uh, opening a tap, right, uh, in your bathroom, if you open a tap and if you uh, open it very slightly uh, so that you get a, a very slow trickle, then uh, of course, you, your, your flow coming out of that tap 
is nice and continuous and, and it has a smooth interface. And then as you increase the velocity, as you open the tap further, um, the flow rate increases and then uh, you get block, uh, droplets breaking up and, uh, and you see turbulent flow. So uh, that's actually what laminar flow is. This is just one very specific uh, view of laminar flow, uh, specifically in a pipeline. Okay, so um, so let's for completeness list the two. So we want to say here in, in uh, flow, uh, we've got u z as a function of r. That's going to equal some fixed u z value. So this is independent of r, whereas in laminar flow, uh, it does change with r. And that's the only thing that's going to change in our equation. You see, uh, if you go back and look at uh, all this development, we had a uh, inside this control space here, uh, uz uh, was constant in this control space, right? Because it's at a specific radial position, at a specific axial position. And then as r and z change, uh, u could change. So in different subvolumes, u may be different. If you look at a different radial position, then uz may be different there. Um, but uh, all this development applied uh, to that specific um, control space. And so all of this is done uh, for u, um, and it's acknowledged u is a function of r, generally speaking. So this development was general. We didn't actually use the assumption of plug flow or laminar flow here. So all that we need to do now to complete this is uh, to say this uz as a function of r, well, in the case of plug flow, it's not a function of r, it's just a, a, a fixed uz. In the case of the laminar flow, then we have to look up the right value of uz given uh, the radial position. Okay. Uh, any questions or comments there? Mm -hmm. uh, excuse me, sir. Yeah. So just really quickly, I wanted to ask, you said that I just want to make sure that capital R, that's for U Z R is equal to U max one minus R over R squared. That capital letter R, that is the real radius of the, you said that's the real radius of the pipeline. Yes. Okay. So in the drawing, um, yeah, it's this position. So between the center line and this position here, um, that's the radius. And if you like, also, it's the inside radius, right? If your real pipeline is given by this, uh, I don't I don't know my color theory enough to, uh, uh, let's say, salmon. So if you look at the salmon pipeline, uh, yeah, the radius is to the inside over here. It's not the outer radius because our flow is on the inside of this pipeline, this real pipeline. So yeah, capital R is that radial position. Okay. Uh, any other questions or comments there? So you see, um, with your um, with this general development, and there is a simplification we can do uh, uh, just now, but with this development, um, uh, with this general development, right? We kept this quite general. Um, we didn't make any assumption. Everything we did, if you look here, um, the only assumption was that we choose a small enough subvolume that all the quantities are constant in that. So, <clears throat> so with this development, we made no assumptions. So this uh, equation is nice in general, and it applies to both situations. The only thing we have to do is specify the nature of the velocity function. Right, so that's uz. Now, if it's in plug flow, um, one of the things we can do is say, well, plug flow implies good mixing in the radial direction. And we'll talk about this more uh, in third year in the reactors class, but uh, there's good radial mixing. So if you are well mixed radially, then it doesn't make sense to worry about any radial gradients. So the gradients in the R direction, you can define it, but this is uh, likely to be close to zero. So if you have uh, uh, no real gradient uh, in the R direction, then you can further simplify this equation. 
and you can say the dx dr so d dx a dr equals zero so that's another thing that we can say uh, in the case of plug flow and so the equation simplifies further like this and we note here that this uh, actually will change how many boundary conditions we need remember um, in the general case we counted as many as five uh, the order of the equation is five right you've got one derivative for time uh, two derivatives for z because the highest derivative here is second uh, second order and then two derivatives for r so overall that's a five and now because uh, of the simplifying assumption of plug flow um, of very good radial mixing no gradients in r and also no gradients in x then that means in the r direction then that means we can uh, ignore this term and so we only need three boundary conditions in this case okay uh, any other questions or comments there All right, uh, then, so, yep. sir, freedom, yeah. The reason, of, the reason of ignoring the third one, is it because of that zero, which makes everything zero or what? Yeah, because of this. So we are saying, oh. um, if you think about it uh, in your, in plug flow, we are very well mixed in the radial direction. So if you take a big pipeline, um, and uh, so you've got your fluid in, in the pipeline, um, fine, the concentration might be changing in the axial direction, right? So your concentration may be doing that um, if you look at any axial position. But we, if we are in plug flow, if we are well mixed in this direction, then if you choose any radial position, you will get the same value. So the same mole fraction applies at any point in plug flow. So if X is the same in the R direction, right? And so that's why that's how we read this. We can pick this at any Z position. So this derivative can be defined at any Z position um, and at any R position. Thank you so much, sir. Okay. Uh, so yeah, you, you can pick it at any Z position but there's no gradient, uh, it's well mixed uh, in the R direction, okay? Okay, sorry. Okay, any other questions or comments then? All right, then moving off that one, um, let's look now at this oh, sir. problem. Yep. Uh, sorry, sir, could you go to that laminar flow equation, please? Here, yeah. So I just want to take it down. Um, look, uh, this is all saved. Uh, just check in the Dropbox folder. So if you look in the Dropbox folder, I am saving everything as I'm working. So uh, that, that's why I like to work in Dropbox, right? I just uh, save everything, including the drawing. So if you go into the Dropbox folder, you'll find uh, everything is there. So today, uh, just look for the, the date, and then it will say dev or development. And so this is the file we are working in today, right? Okay, so that's our laminar flow. Um, so now uh, in this second problem, uh, let's just save this one out. So in, uh, let's do a, a quick sketch of this drug delivery problem now. So in the second problem, we are, uh, it's, it's a pharmaceutical process and we are creating a, a drug. And the way we uh, create that drug is by first painting a paste onto the drug. And so we have, um, let's look at it in cross section first. We have a substrate. So this is our drug substrate. This is what we want to be the drug uh, eventually. 
And then the way we create that drug is to um, is to paint onto the surface a paste. So this paste contains component A, right? So component A is sitting here in the drug, and we want A to diffuse in, uh, into the surface, uh, sorry, into the volume of this uh, substrate. So we want this to happen. We want component A to enter here. Right, so component A um, is, is a drug with some kind of medical benefit. And uh, your paste here, uh, this is an inert substrate. So the red block is just, if you think about, uh, you know, if you, if you take some, uh, uh, what's a kind of uh, a neutral drug that I could name, like if you just take an aspirin, right? Uh, so an aspirin with the, uh, the, if you think of the solid material of that aspirin, right, um, that's uh, the, the, the red block. And the way that in this case, the way that we are creating this aspirin uh, pull is by painting a paste onto the surface of the substrate. So before it was a real aspirin uh, pull, it, uh, it was just an inert. If you swallowed it, it, it had no medical benefit, right? But now we are painting a paste onto it, and uh, we diffuse into that um, into that solid substrate. So this is some solid substrate uh, that we want component A to diffuse into. Um, and what we have here um, is the equilibrium between the paste and the substrate. So at equilibrium we have some concentration of component A in the paste. And generally speaking, there's some other concentration of component A in the substrate. And remember uh, your thermodynamics course, your vapor liquid equilibrium. We know that um, if a gas and a liquid are at equilibrium, so even if enough time has passed and they've reached equilibrium, in the gas phase, clearly, there's some uh, mole fraction, and in the liquid, there's some other mole fraction. Generally speaking, the mole fractions are different even when the two uh, species are in equilibrium. Even after a long time has passed, there's, there is still some difference in the mole fractions. So we can, um, we can signify that, or, or we, can, uh, we can quantify that, or we can write out the relationship between the two values in this way. So there, uh, we, we define an equilibrium constant K, and then we define the concentrations in each phase. So we think of these as two phases, right? The paste on the surface and the substrate itself. Okay, um, so in the, in the substrate, let's say painted with A. So yeah, CAS, I think that's actually the paste concentration, it's painted with, paste. yeah, that's the paste concentration. So it's a little bit confusing, this notation. We should use P or something, right? So that's the concentration of A in the paste. And that's equilibrium, but we know we are not at equilibrium in the beginning. We are given the value of the equilibrium, uh, con uh, the equilibrium constant and the diffusivity, right, of A through the substrate. Um, and we are concerned with overdosing this pill with A. So as it says here, even though uh, it's medically beneficial, component A is medically beneficial, um, it can be addictive. So we want to stay within the safety limit uh, where it's not addictive, right? So we don't want to exceed a total number of moles of A of 0.5 uh, for each capsule, and we are given the dimensions of the capsule. Um, we've simplified it to be a rectangular capsule, right? Not that kind of typical pearl shape. Okay, and we want to know how this concentration is changing. Well, what we actually want to know is how much A we have. And if we think about it, it's that's not such a straightforward problem, right? Um, because we are saying by the end of the day, we are going to have this rectangular pull, right? And 
it's going to have a certain total amount of A in it. And that total amount of A is not evenly distributed, right? If we think about how A diffuses into that particle, it's going to do something like this, right? So fine, it's at the equilibrium value here at the interface, um, but as uh, but initially uh, it's zero everywhere. So it's zero. And, and here, of course, uh, let's take one direction. Let's take the Z direction. So let's say we are looking at Z in this direction. And so we are looking at the concentration of A as it varies with Z. Um, yeah, maybe I ought to reorient this thing. Let's see if it does this allow rotation, not really. Um, okay, uh, let's just redraw here. So we want this direction to be the thickness of the drug. So we are diffusing into the drug like this, right? So the paste is sitting out here. The paste is sitting on the drug here. And we are diffusing into the substrate. So <clears throat> we expect initially, uh, so at t equals zero, that's our profile. Then A starts to diffuse into the rest of the substrate. And so more and more will diffuse into it. And if we leave it for long enough, it will eventually steady out to something like that. Now we assume that around here is a danger zone. We assume that around here, um, we have too much of A and the pull is addictive or classified as addictive. We also assume that down here, um, the, there's too little of A in the pull. And, and so <clears throat> we want some nice, there exists in between the two, some region where this pull is, um, is medically beneficial and not addictive. So, <clears throat> so we want to find this time, right? All, all of this is with time, right? We, uh, uh, we are talking about now as T, uh, as T increases, um, we are getting these different profiles. The concentration is changing uh, with Z um, as time is passing. So we want to know when must we stop? There is a specific time when we have 50 moles, uh, 50 moles or zero, what was it? 0 0.5 moles or something, um, uh, 0 0.5 moles, right? So when we have 0 0.5 moles, then we want to stop A diffusing into the particle. In other words, um, that is the time, this time when we must wash off the paste, right? So we are trying to figure out when must we uh, suddenly blast off all this paste so that we don't overload this uh, substrate uh, with the drug, with A? So that's what we are trying to find, right? The time when we have a specific amount in that drug. And you see, it's not so straightforward because our mole fraction is changing across that drug. So um, you can see your concentration is changing with Z. It's also changing with X and Y, right? So we could also talk about in these directions, um, but we are going to assume a kind of symmetry. In other words, if you look at this uh, drug, if you look at the dimensions, right? Um, two centimeters by two centimeters and then five millimeters. So two centimeters is large in comparison with the five millimeters. So it's something like this, two centimeters by two centimeters, and then five millimeters. So it looks something like that. It's like a thin wide slab, right? Similar shape as our concrete slab from before. And we have this paste that's on the surface initially. So we've uh, initially we've 
we've put a paste down on the surface. So you see in the, in the X and Y directions, there's no real change happening. Your, um, your component A is the same. If you, if you pick a point here and another point there and another point there, all sitting on the surface, um, then you've got the same concentration. And also if you look maybe one millimeter um, in the Z direction under the same points. So if you pick a point here, a point under there and another point under there, all those points are experiencing the same thing, right? A is just diffusing down into, um, into the slab or into the substrate. So all those values are going to be the same. So there's no difference in the uh, Y and X directions. The only uh, thing we are concerned about is the, uh, the changes in the Z direction. And uh, that's one of the key things to figure out when you start any of these problems. Where are my changes actually happening? What, uh, what variables uh, do I need to keep, right? We've got four variables always, right? T, X, Y, Z, or T, R, theta, Z, or T, R, theta, one, theta, two, for uh, rectangular, cylindrical, and spherical coordinates, right? So always four dimensions. So we can see there's a time issue. So we need to keep time. Um, the concentration is changing in time. We can see in terms of X and Y, right? Uh, dimensions along the surface of uh, the, the big flat surface here. Um, in terms of X and Y, there are no gradients. The same thing is happening everywhere. Um, and only in Z are things changing, right? In Z, um, we are diffusing into uh, the, uh, the substrate. So the changes will happen in the Z direction. So we are keeping T and Z. Okay, so let's do another drawing. Okay, now let's look in the Z direction. Let's redraw that box. Okay, and we've got our substrate as well. Not substrate, I mean paste. So there's our paste. And I guess we can define Z going into the um, pointing down into this direction. So let's now pick uh, our control space. So we'll pick a control space between Z and Z plus Delta Z. So we can see, we can say um, this is Z and Z plus Delta Z here. And we are anticipating diffusion of component A, diffusion of component A like so. We are also going to assume that this is um, quite a, a small concentration. So in terms of what we are diffusing into, right, the substrate has a higher concentration. So, um, Component A is diffusing um, against the substrate and the substrate is a solid support. And, and so that has a high concentration in comparison with the small amount of, uh, of component A that's diffusing in. So, uh, so let's do the development here. I do have a solution, but uh, let's do the development. So, this is all part of the question, right? So <clears throat> we have our component A diffusing in, and um, we we can say that the number of moles delta in A 
delta n a equals. So we want to know uh, what's the number of moles of a in the subspace. So that's going to be the concentration of a at position z times the volume of that space. And then we can define a c to be the the area in the x and y directions. So that's the area two centimeters by two centimeters. And then delta Z is the direction of interest. So that's our volume AC delta Z. So we should say before this um, delta V equals AC delta Z. And then uh, NA looks like that, right? So that's the amount in there. And then the reason that we said it's infinitely dilute, that the concentration of A is very small, that's because we would normally write a molar, a molar flux like this. We would say the molar flux of A equals, there's the diffusion flux first, so D, A, D, Z, and then there's the convection flux, or the bulk flux, N, A plus, B. So if uh, XA is small, um, this term, the, your contribution uh, from A uh, is relatively small. So, uh, so that's one aspect. The other one is if it's in equimolar counter diffusion, uh, this is a zero, right? So assuming equimolar counter diffusion, uh, it simplifies. So equimolar counter diffusion gives us that um, our molar flux is estimated in this way right so that's molar flux and then in terms of our balance um, for our space z to z plus delta z we've got flux coming in here and then flux going out there so we can uh, we can say the rate of change of the moles of a in the space so ddt of this DDT of the number of moles in the space um, is equal to, and we can write here DDT of all that equals. And so the rate of change of moles equals the diffusion flux arriving here times the area there minus the diffusion flux leaving there. So what's coming in is a plus, and then the diffusion flux itself is minus C, D, D, X, A, D, Z. And all this applies at position Z. So that's what's coming into the space. So that's the flux, and then we have to multiply by the area. So the area that's normal to this flux is the, the flat face area. Right, uh, so if if we were drawing it like this, right, then the area uh, that's normal to the diffusion flux is this big uh, flat surface here, AC. So this is just AC. And then leaving the space is going to be uh, minus the flux at Z plus Delta Z. So that's the flux at Z plus Delta Z. And then the same area applies. The area is not changing as we look at different Z positions. Okay, and then we can do the usual thing, divide through by AC Delta Z. So all of this becomes, You can see the ACs will cancel, and then you've got a delta Z here. So ACs can go. We can reorder this also. So you've got a minus minus, so you might as well write that up front as a plus. So by the end of the day, we can write here all of this. And in fact, let's take out a C and a, a CD as well. So this evaluated at position Z. So 
sorry, Z plus, Z plus delta Z. That's the first term minus, and then the term we move to the other side that's evaluated at Z. And then we are dividing both sides by AC delta Z. So we need to divide by a delta Z here. Right, and then if you're taking the limits, if you take the limit, so limit delta Z goes to zero, gives us the regular diffusion equation. So, and I actually want to move the C in here. So if I multiply C by XA, then this will become, this becomes CA. And this is a, a CA. So, <clears throat> so if you look at this, this is nothing but um, D, DC, uh, or this is DDZ of DDZ of CA. So this is simply D2CA DZ squared. D2CA excuse me sir yep so if you said in this equation d by dt ca z plus d is equal to plus d dca by dz dca by dz so, uh, where, sorry where are you looking at this uh are you looking here yes sir. i want to understand that because everywhere else it was dxa by dz so why is that now dca by dz well, I'm just multiplying here. So C is the total concentration. So if I multiply total concentration by mole fraction, then I'll get the concentration of component A. Um, and I'm doing that because on the left-hand side, uh, we've got uh, the concentration CA. So I'm just trying to avoid having two dependent variables and just by multiplying concentration by mole fraction. Uh, does that answer it? Yes, sir. Okay, thanks. Okay, so that's our equation. Um, and this applies at all points uh, inside our um, in, inside our substrate. Um, and of course, to solve this, we need boundary conditions. We can say uh, the two that apply are that the um, uh, number one is that we simply know the concentration initially. And if we know that there was none of component A initially in there, then we can say CA at T equals zero at all Z positions equals zero. So component A was not present anywhere initially in the substrate. Then uh, we also have uh, the, um, we have that the concentration of A at the surface, so for all time at Z equals zero, right? That's just inside of the substrate. So maybe I should write this as zero plus, right? Because we want to say just inside of the substrate. We are not talking about a position just outside the substrate because then we are in a different phase. So to specify that we are just inside the substrate, noting that Z starts at zero here and increases like so, then we can say uh, Z at zero plus, that's equal to, and remember just at this uh, region, um, our, um, our substrate is in equilibrium with our uh, paste. So we can use the equilibrium relationship that's been given. So we can say, um, Right, we need the substrate concentration. So it's going to be the paste concentration divided by K. And that's going to be fixed for all time. So the paste concentration divided by the equilibrium value, that's going to be uh, just inside there. And we still need one more. Um, let's see, what do we have in this problem that tells us? So, so it's not so clear, but uh, one thing. 
Yeah, I, mean, I think we, we might actually need more information. We might need to specify something else. Um, I'm just looking here at my old, uh, so we are assuming that the concentration at the, okay, so yeah, so here I'm saying um, that we are assuming the drug never penetrates all the way to the other side, to the other end, uh, by the time we actually need to wash it off. This is a big assumption, right? This is not uh, something that's really obvious. Um, yeah, it's, it's a bit hard for me to justify this assumption. So we are going to state it as an assumption. Um, and you could say that's just because we don't have more information given in the problem. So I normally wouldn't leave it as open as this. Uh, there should be an extra piece of information that tells you um, about another boundary that you can apply. I know why I'm doing this. I know uh, I want to use a nice analytical solution, so that helps towards that. Um, but anyway, that's an assumption that we're going to make there as well. Uh, so let's say this should be given with the problem. We, we should have been told this. Okay, so if we uh, do take that, then with these other two, those are enough boundary conditions for this problem. Okay, and we've run out of time now. But uh, you can start thinking about the next bits. You can think about, well, um, the, what the question was given this information that if you happen to know, uh, well, if you have an equation of this form with uh, boundary conditions of that type, then that solution applies. So we'll carry on next time looking at how we can use the solution to figure out the number of moles accumulated in that, uh, uh, in that substrate. Okay, any questions or comments there in closing? Uh, please note that uh, Wednesday, there's a bit of a disruption. Um, so we won't be able to meet in our regular Wednesday slot, but we'll use the Friday slot instead. Okay, so I'll send an email about that to, uh, with the Zoom link and all of that. Okay, uh, then I guess that's it for today. Uh, so, Thanks for coming. See you in the next one. Thank you, sir. Have a good day. Thanks, you too.